Hello there, a very good evening and welcome to another edition of Newsline coming to you, of course, live and direct from our News First studios here in Colombo. Today is a special day, of course, for the United States of America as they will be getting a new president. President-elect Joe Biden will be sworn in uh, at around 10.30 Sri Lankan time in the United States in Washington, D.C. There are a number of uh, first times, uh, first in histories that are happening, uh, of course, in the U.S. Uh, the set for the second time in uh, U.S. history, uh, the incumbent president, uh, Donald Trump, will not be attending uh, the inauguration of his successor. And there are many other uh, issues that are taking place, of course, in the United States. But of course, uh, as a world power, the United States has a certain influence on the rest of the world. And to discuss the a change in administration in the United States and how it will affect the rest of the world and especially uh, in a Sri Lankan context, how it will affect Sri Lanka. We've got with us today former diplomat, Diane Jayatilaka. A very good evening. Sarah, good evening. To the show. Good evening. Hi, everyone. Um, sir, first question, is there going to be a drastic change in the United States policy towards the rest of the world with President Donald Trump, who was uh, a flamboyant president, uh, one that the world has never seen before quite? Uh, on his efficacy, what, did what he do was right? There's a different question entirely. But will there be a change? Oh, yes, there'll be a dramatic change. There already is. When you listen to Joe Biden hmm. uh, speaking in Delaware, saying farewell hmm. uh, to his city, Wilmington, and the state, um, and also at the memorial for the 400,000 people who died hmm. uh, due to COVID-19, hmm. Uh, you see a very different kind of personality, hmm. a personality who's caring, who's empathetic. Hmm. Uh, so there's going to be a change. It's going to be very drastic hmm. because Donald Trump was a very drastic change from everything that had gone before. It was a drastic change from the establishment. Not only the establishment, from civility, from science, from reason, from moderation, <laughs> from, from you, know, you name it. The whole democratic political culture mm. uh, and the culmination of that was of course the assault on the capital mm. by his supporters mm. so uh, trump was a rupture mm. from everything that had existed arguably since the founding fathers of the united states of america mm. there are four there will be a very drastic change from what was a drastic change uh, even the attempt at normalization, hmm. at restoration of norms of uh, civility, hmm. will be a drastic contrast to what happened over the last four years. But it will be drastic for other reasons as well. Hmm. Uh, the world is in crisis hmm. because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Hmm. The world economy is in crisis. The United States economy is in crisis. Hmm. U.S. relations with uh, China and the rest of the world have been thrown into crisis by President Trump. Hmm. And uh, the new administration, the Biden-Harris administration, will be attempting an entirely new approach, which combines hmm. the best of what has worked in the pre-Trump period hmm. with some new thinking, because the whole situation is, is new. So you will see a major change. This is not just a turn of the page. Hmm. Uh, it's a whole new chapter. One may even argue that uh, it's a different change book. Of book. It's a different book. <laughs> so, speaking about uh, the impact, of course, that this can have on Sri Lanka, uh, we saw the United States, uh, we saw uh, the State Secretary coming into Sri Lanka. He made certain pledges, uh, he made certain statements in Sri Lanka. Will these continue to be valid after the uh, coming in of the new administration? Well, the incoming administration hmm. is going to be even far more concerned about issues of democracy and human rights and racial justice, racial equality hmm. than the Trump administration. Hmm. That's because that's the nature of the Biden-Harris administration. Hmm. Uh, they've come into office as a result of a huge uh, popular uh, upheaval hmm. around the George Floyd murder. Hmm. Uh, the, the ideology that is driving uh, Joe Biden is, is by no means, as Trump said, a, a left-wing ideology. But Joe Biden was, for most of his career, hmm. a centrist liberal. Right. However, 
as he said during this campaign, uh, he is influenced by, he, in his own words, hmm. uh, the social teaching of the Catholic Church. He's very proud of the fact that he's an Irish Catholic. Hmm. Uh, so he's socially very conscious. Hmm. Um, and even after the January 6th assault on the Capitol by the far right, what Joe Biden said was that he got this uh, message from his granddaughter hmm. who contrasted the brutal handling of the Black Lives Matter protest in Washington DC hmm. with the gentle handling of the far right protest. Hmm. Now for Biden to say that and he said this shows that there's systemic injustice. Right. Biden has shifted to a far more progressive stand than he took. He was, he was never a conservative. He was hmm. always a liberal. But he's far more progressive than before. And his entire administration, Kamala Harris, especially Jake Sullivan, his national security advisor, right. and uh, Anthony Blinken, his Secretary of State, all of them are deeply committed to the revival of democracy, which they think Donald Trump destroyed. Well, he retreated from in the United States, but also in the world. They feel that the values of democracy have to be reasserted. Uh, Joe Biden promised that in his first year, he will have a global uh, conference of democracies. Hmm. So the issues of democracy are going to be very important. Now, Sri Lanka, the United States is the oldest democracy in the world. Right. The United States, as you know, from the time of Barack Obama's pivot to Asia, hmm. through Trump's uh, Indo-Pacific strategy has shifted its attention to Asia. Hmm. Sri Lanka is Asia's oldest democracy. So right. I don't think that the world's oldest democracy, which is trying to revive democracy as part of its attempt to face down the Chinese competition, hmm. is going to be unmindful of the state of affairs in Asia's oldest democracy at a time when Asia is the most important, probably the most important part of the world for the United States, or one of the two, the other being the Atlantic Alliance. Mm. So yes, they're going to be scrutinizing Sri Lanka far more than the Trump administration mm. uh, on issues of democracy. They're not going to just sit around and watch Asia's oldest democracy to drift or be or degenerate into uh, some kind of despotism hmm. uh, because somebody here thinks that they have unlimited support from China, whether that's hmm. true or not. Hmm. Uh, so as part of the overall competition with China, hmm. the United States will be looking at Sri Lanka even more than the Trump administration did because it will be looking at it not only from the military strategic point of view hmm. as Trump did, Right. But also from the point of view of democracy, human rights, justice, racial equality and other values that the Biden administration holds very dear indeed and is very sincere about. You spoke about um, the oldest democracy in Asia drifting a little bit towards China. Uh, but no, no, no. Drifting towards despotism. Despotism. Or authoritarianism. Right. And that's very clear. Right. Uh, militarization. I mean, mm. we are not... We are not the democracy that we were any more than the United States under Trump right. was the democracy that it used to be. Right. Do you mean that we are not the democracy that we were 10 years ago, 4 years ago? We are not the democracy that we were even in 2019. Right. Because uh, of two things hmm. mainly, uh, I'll make it three. Uh, there is no longer a celebration of the values of democracy no adherence to democracy as a value. Uh, the other, there are other values that have come into play, ultranationalism, like in the case of Donald Trump, hmm. uh, this idea of discipline, the militarization that is rampant uh, through hmm. what used to be uh, a, very, uh, a civilian administrative system that worked for us. There was a proposal for military training for people who are 18 and above. I, I mean, that is, that is horrendous. The United States had the draft. <laughs> It almost tore the uh, U.S. society uh, into pieces hmm. during Vietnam, and it has an all-volunteer professional army. We won the war against the Tigers with an all-volunteer professional army. Now, what do we need military training for? The minister who had suggested military training for everybody of 18 and over has said that it teaches men to uh, look, to stand straight, look people in the eye, 
build leadership and, and you know strong leadership. Now we had strong leadership from DS Saranaga through Madam Banaranaga to through Rana Singh Premadasa to Mahindra Rajapaks and none of them had military training. So it's another it's a crypto fascist statement really. And, mm. and uh, in any case, it doesn't make economic sense. It will sink our already sinking economy because it's so expensive. <laughs> Field Marshal Sarath Fonseca said it will take 75 billion rupees or something. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of these Trumpian crazy things, but even Trump wasn't that bad. <laughs> so, uh, of course, uh, moving forward uh, with Sri Lanka's relations deepening, of course, with China, with aid coming in from China, uh, despite all of that, the United States continues to remain our number one trading partner. Moving forward with the new administration in the United States, how do you believe Sri Lanka should really structure their foreign policy towards especially these two nations? It's very easy. No Sri Lankan administration which is rational can de-link economically from China because the Chinese have the surplus and the willingness to invest that surplus. Hmm just as Japan did in the 1980s, mm. and uh, we, as a developing country, need that. So, we need the economic relationship. Now, how we handle that economic relationship, you know, that's, that's up to the economists to talk about. Uh, but what we must not do is have this increasing integration of what's known as models of governance. Now, there was a, a virtual conference between the SLPP and, the Chinese, Communist and, and Party. the Chinese Communist Party where it was said that uh, experience on models of governance will be shared hmm. uh, with Sri Lanka. And more recently there was a New Year's Eve message, New Year's message, sorry, 2021 official message which said that the Belt and Road Initiative uh, will align with President Gotabe Rajapaksa's election manifesto, uh, vistas of Prosperity Blender, and Splendor. Prosperity, you know, some very garish title. Uh, now, I've been... During this conference, there was also a statement made post-conference that yeah. uh, the Sri Lanka Podhujana Peramuna is looking to be more like the Communist Party of China. Well, that would be an improvement because the Communist Party uh, insists on exams for promotions. I mean, I know what the Chinese Communist Party is like. Uh, it's a very Confucian sort of mandarinate and you don't get that here. But uh, look, it's, it's crazy because Sri Lanka has been very close to China from the days of SWRD Bandaranaika. Hmm. Never, never, never has the Chinese Communist Party, even un under our closest, uh, you know, when our closest friend Zhou Enlai was Prime Minister and then Foreign Minister, hmm. uh, never have the Chinese referred to the election manifestos of any of our leaders, however close and warm, you know, SWRD Bandaranaika, Madam Bandaranaika and so on and so forth. Now, this is new. And this is happening for two reasons. One, students of China and Chinese foreign policy have noted that from late 2019 into 2020, there has been a kind of a surge or an over-assertiveness on the part of China. There has been friction with Indonesia, Malaysia and Vietnam mm -hmm. at sea. And then of course the, the clash with India. Mm. Uh, and and there is kind of this, this over-assertiveness uh, has lent itself to these declarations of uh, consensus between the two leaders, uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa and Pre uh, President Xi Jinping. Hmm. Now, what's the consensus about? The official Chinese statement on New Year's Day talks about joining hands uh, in facing challenging situations in international relations and regional uh, uh, situations. Now, if you are joining hands with China or with the United States uh, in facing international and regional situations, then we can't be non-aligned or neutral or balanced or equidistant or anything like that. We, we are joining hands <laughs> uh, because they are not joining hands with each other. Right. So, we have to rethink that policy. It's not in our interest. Mm. I'm not for joining any bloc which is anti-China. Mm. Uh, we can't afford it. We shouldn't do it. There's no reason. And the Chinese have been our friends. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, the Americans say friends don't help friends to drive drunk. Now, friends certainly, two friends don't get drunk and then try to drive. I mean, you know, right. we shouldn't be doing that. Hmm. We should be measured, balanced, uh, and always think of what Lakshman Khadrugama would have said and done under these circumstances. I, I think that's the ticket. Hmm. Uh, uh, we certainly must unhook ourselves from any kind of uh, integration or 
Or even uh, perceived uh, integration. Perceived integration. When it comes to models of governance, hmm. the Chinese Communist Party always knew that even when we had the very warmest of personal relations, as I said with the Pandranayakas or Mahindra Rajapaksa, hmm. or indeed Rana Singh and Prabhadasa, President Prabhadasa, who got all his school, the, the textiles for his school uniforms programs free from hmm. China and hmm. invited the representative of the Chinese Communist Party as the only foreign delegates to attend one of the UNP's conventions, mind hmm. you. Never did China uh, cross that firewall. Hmm. China had its own model of governance, of one party. Sri Lanka had our own. State. We were Asia's oldest democracy. Different rules, different systems. Doctor, we need to that cross has over. Been, that firewall has been breached and that's bad. And the Americans will be watching that. Hmm. Whether we are changing our system hmm. because they perceive China as now, for the first time, hmm. projecting its model of governance as an alternative to democracy. democracy. And whether that's true or not is something else. That's the American perception. It's a perception that is not limited to the Trump, what, to the old outgoing Trump mm. administration. But you can see that in the writings of Jake Sullivan, uh, Anthony mm. Blinken, and even Joe Biden. Mm. Sri Lanka must not give the perception, as we have so far, mm. of moving into that camp of the model of governance away from democracy democracy which you know we have shared with the united states and india mm -hmm. uh, for so long well we would cross over to a short commercial break now this discussion has really come to a very interesting point uh, so stay tuned don't go anywhere we will be back right after this short commercial break news first news line Welcome back. You're watching Newsline live on TV One. Getting back to our discussion with uh, Dr. Diane Jayathilaka. Doctor, you said that uh, the United States' stance towards establishing democracies in the world, uh, equality uh, and racial harmony in the world, will be tougher under a Biden-Harris uh, administration. We have uh, the uh, sessions of the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council coming up, and uh, Sri Lanka is uh, at the very least, I'd say, in a sticky situation on that front. Do you believe that the United States will assert um, their intentions of establishing democracy across the world by making Sri Lanka an example out of it? Well, the United States has not come back as a member of the Council because President Trump walked they out withdrew. of the Council. Mm. But the US will be very much there. I mean, all 193 countries mm. are there. Not everybody is a member state. Member there state. are 47 mm. member states. Even in 2009, when the West was moving a resolution against Sri Lanka, but we got uh, almost two-thirds of the vote and we won, mm -hmm. uh, uh, our own resolution won, mm -hmm. uh, we know from WikiLeaks that uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton wrote on April 4th mm -hmm. to the U.S. mission in Geneva. They weren't officially members at that time, mm -hmm. nor were we. But we were the two players, we were players in, in that arena. Hmm. She wrote to the US mission saying, uh, do line by, uh, send the draft resolution to Washington, we'll do line by line edits. The Sri Lankan side should not win a diplomatic victory here, uh, get votes uh, for the resolution and so on. But you know, we, we prevailed, that didn't hmm. work. So you don't have to be a member to be a player, hmm. especially not when you're in the United States. <laughs> and and we, we are not the United States, but we were a protagonist, hmm. though we weren't members anymore. Hmm. The United States uh, will be influential this time. Uh, and, and we are going to look a little silly because we are basing ourselves on the Trumpian propaganda against the UN Human Rights Council. Hmm. Uh, our officials still are engaging in uh, Trump speak, you know, old language which the Americans have now, the electorate has overthrown. Mm -hmm. Nobody talks that way anymore. We uh, are the last Trumpians. Uh, well, maybe together with Bolsonaro and Netanyahu. <laughs> you know. uh, so, uh, we, we are, we've run out of time. But we should be able to do okay for a very simple reason. I don't think we will, but we should be able to. It should be easy because According to the constitution of the UN Human Rights Council, and I was the vice president of the council when that constitution was gaveled through. Right. 
The majority of members of the UN Human Rights Council come from Asia, Pacific, Africa, and Latin America, these three regions, hmm. not the West. Hmm. Uh, that is because the Council reflects the composition of the world hmm. in terms of regions, the uh, right. proportion of population. Hmm. So if you have a Council in which the majority are from Latin America, Africa, and the Asia Pacific, hmm. there's no reason that you shouldn't prevail or at least have a, a standoff, hmm. a, draw, a drawn game, hmm. uh, if your diplomacy is any good. Hmm. I mean, if you, if you have the right line. But uh, right now, uh, I, I find it fascinating, uh, not only as a former ambassador who was there and a former vice president of the Human Rights Council, but as a student of international relations and a political scientist, which is here you have the Gotabi Rajapaksa regime with its uh, ultranationalist, neo isolationist ideology, mm. uh, which does not believe in any kind of accountability at all. I mean, I'm not for international accountability, but governments are held accountable because human rights is something that we all uh, should enjoy as human beings. Now, philosophically, this regime does not believe in the universality of human rights, hmm. does not believe in the value of human rights, believes that there are other things which are more important. higher than, than human rights, and uh, is of the view that we are not accountable to anybody. It's the mirror image of the previous uh, UNP government, which thought that there was no such thing as national sovereignty. This is the, that UNP government standing on its head. Hmm. Uh, this government believes that national sovereignty is the only thing there is hmm. uh, and, and that uh, it's absolute. Hmm. The, the UNP foreign minister at that time, and particularly the prime minister, even more than the foreign minister, Prime Minister Vikram Singh, uh, thought that uh, sovereignty was imaginary. Hmm. And this president thinks that sovereignty is everything. They hmm. were both wrong. Now, you can't go into the council and try to convince the council that, look, whatever we did was right because we have a 2,500 year history. And You can't uh, be a macho man in the council. No, no, you can't <laughs> uh, go on the basis of Singhalese exceptionalism. <laughs> you know, we have... Uh, what, what is that? Make America great again or America first. But Americans do have American exceptionalism. Yes, but the trick is this. Well, not trick. The reason they succeed is that American exceptionalism, like French exceptionalism, is projected as universal. Universal uh, values like democracy, individual freedom, right? And America is exceptional. Because America and France is perceived as the, as the fathers of democracy. Stand for these universal human values. Hmm. Now, the Cubans also feel that way. They don't call themselves exceptional, hmm. but they feel that they are the vanguard hmm. uh, of uh, values that are universal. That is uh, solidarity, equality, fair play, social justice, etc., etc. Hmm. Uh, so, Sri Lanka, that's not our point. Our point is we have this ancient civilization. <laughs> which is better than everybody else's. Hmm. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, it's a singly or Sri Lankan version of Deutschland Uber Alles. It's uh, uh, <laughs> that, uh, no, it, that is not, it, that's not going to fly in the council. And, and appointing yet another commission is not going to fly when you have not implemented what your own LLRC said in 2011. Hmm. Not to mention several other commissions. Hmm. And you just pardon the first thing you do when you come into office is to pardon a guy whom the domestic, the Sri Lankan courts have, have found guilty of cutting the throat of a five-year-old child. And the first thing is to pardon him. Uh, and this is somebody who was arrested by the Sri Lankan military police hmm. in 2000. Hmm. And the case went through the entire Sri Lankan system. Having pardoned him, and he was met by the Secretary of Defense when he came out, uh, the present Secretary of Defense, hmm. not the last one. Right. Uh, and uh, then you say, look, our courts will do the job. You've just thrown out, you just released a guy whom your courts put into jail. Hmm. So then how can you say right. our courts will take care of it? You have ruined the credibility, not of your courts, but if you're not going to listen to what your courts have said in a matter so serious, with the spotlight of the world on you, I mean, just because there was COVID, of course, people didn't look at Sri Lanka, but now they're looking hmm. at Sri Lanka hmm. again. 
then how can you say we will have a purely domestic uh, accountability mechanism and a purely domestic um, a commission? I mean, I, I was all for that. Hmm. But this is, uh, you know, many, many years down the road and you've done everything you shouldn't do when you have to face Geneva. Everything. We, 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 were, we were in a hole. Hmm. We were in a hole uh, from 2012. Hmm. Because in 2009, we won. Hmm. Um, I was moved out six weeks after. Uh, two, we were safe for three years. Hmm. Just as Sri Lanka was safe from terrorism for three, for three some years after. Nine years. Uh, uh, no, no, after Mahindra Rajapaksa right. left office, 2015. Hmm. Uh, then we started losing during President Ra Mahindra Rajapaksa's second term. 2012, 2013, 2014, we lost in Geneva. Hmm. Then came Prime Minister Vikram Singer and did something that no country ever does, co-signed a resolution which was self-indicting, mm. indicted ourselves, because mm. the resolution starts with uh, commending the report of uh, Prince Zaid al Hussein, who was the UN Human Rights High Commissioner High at that time, which right. said that uh, there were system-wide uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity. So mm. it starts with that and we said fine, we, you know, we, we accepted that. Right. So we dug ourselves further into the hole. Mm. And then comes this administration of President Gotabe Rajapaksa and digs even deeper by everything from releasing Sonal Ratnayaka through to the COVID mandatory cremation, which only two mm. countries in the world, of which, one of which we are, mm. uh, engages in and so many, so many other things. Uh, right up to the Mulevaikal monument. Monument and, being you know, demolished. All of that will come up. Right. Uh, so we just kept on digging further and further. Uh, well, in, doctor, in only, only, only time will be able to tell, of course, what will ensue, ensue at the uh, Human Rights Council sessions that uh, will begin quite soon. Thank you very much, Dr. Dan Jayatilaka, for joining us on our show and giving us so much of insight into uh, the change of administration, of course, in the United States, how it will affect Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka's future in the international arena. Thank you. And thank you very much to all our viewers out there. We cross over to the news now. Take care and God bless.